Um, I just want to give a warm welcome to Bante and to um, Nandana, who's here, who uh, is sort of our connection to Bhikkhu Sambodhi. Um, Nandana is a, a friend of Common Ground and uh, connected with us about a year ago in the last year or so, um, and uh, welcomed and invited another monastic, Ajahn Brahmali. Is it Ajahn Brahmali? Yeah. Brahmali. Yeah. It's, so maybe some of you were at that program here. Um, so I'll turn it over to Nandana now to introduce Bhante. So thanks so much to, to both Nandana and Bhante for being here. Wouldn't, Thank you, Gabe. Wouldn't you like to move that camera a little bit up, you know, because uh, I'm quite at the edge of the image? Yes. Yeah, it's better, I think. Up to you. <laughs> okay, yeah. I hope everyone can hear me. I wonder whether the Zoom participants of on Zoom can hear. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Gabe, for asking me to uh, giving me the honor to introduce uh, Bhikkhu Sambodhi. Uh, this is a special gathering today, uh, and those who are uh, joining us on Zoom uh, as well, uh, because I feel that we are all kind of connected through some common uh, interest, common thread. We all have the desire and the yearning to learn uh, Buddha's teachings. So I am not going to talk a lot about uh, Bhante's you know, background and everything, because I think you, you all have seen the poster. And there is a nice write-up uh, that uh, Gabe has uh, done uh, about Bhante's uh, 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 life before he became a, a monk and then after also he also after he became a monk. Uh, and uh, uh, before I jump into that introduction I want to give which is not about you know his his degrees or his education or anything like that uh, I just want to say I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Buddha's fundamental teaching teachings about the four noble truths and suffering and dissatisfactoriness and unsatisfactoriness of life and dukkha, you know, all that. So tonight is not going to be an exception because after a while you're going to be saying, you're, you're going to be wanting and wanting, wanting to hear that beautiful Minnesota accent, which you will not hear from both of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, once you notice that, it'll be the end of suffering. So please notice that and, and be content with that. And I, I hope you'll be okay with, uh, with, the, with the accent, the foreign accent. So we can call this uh, the evening of foreign accents <laughs> uh, tonight. Uh, the only way I can introduce uh, uh, Bhikkhu uh, Sambodhi uh, is uh, by referring to the first meeting we had with him virtually about uh, several months ago uh, uh, on Zoom with a group of friends uh, in Minnesota. And uh, something that he said during our discussion, and I can't remember exactly what the question was. There was a question asked by somebody about mindfulness or how to practice mindfulness. And he said these like three or four sentences. Uh, from what I recall, I can't recall word, you know, in verbatim what he said, but. What he said was, he said, uh, mindfulness is, is uh, presence. Uh, and then he said, uh, mindfulness also has an element of remembering. And then he said, remember to be present. And that was like a, you know, it was the most profound way I have heard someone explain what mindfulness was. I mean, I have been practicing, I have been reading so much literature and scriptures, but when he said, remember to be present, that was it for me. So that is my introduction of uh, Bhikkhu Sambodhi tonight. Uh, and I hope, as I said, you will notice you're wanting to hear something that we cannot <laughs> deliver probably. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That would be a theme for the whole evening talk, you know, about uh, mindfulness, uh, presence, and how to 
cultivated. <laughs> but anyway, um, as for my English accent, first I think I need to check out whether you understand when I say Buddha's teaching. Do you understand? <laughs> I'm asking because when I was traveling here, I stopped for six days on Maui. And there I met uh, someone who was not a uh, Buddha's follower, and uh, he did not understand when I said Buddha's teaching. You know, some Americans, I think, maybe main, mostly in California, they say, they don't say Buddha, they say something like Buddha. So Buddha. <laughs> and some people have so, such a keen, like, um, very narrow ability to understand you know they don't understand it, they don't don't understand it if it's just slightly different you know like slightly different way of pronunciation of vowel or something they don't they can get it so so you understand okay that's good i am going to use it quite often <laughs> <clears throat> you may also notice that i don't use almost i almost never use the word buddhism or Buddhist, because uh, I realized not long ago the vast difference between what the Buddha was teaching and what this uh, word Buddhism mean to different people. I would say that there are as many Buddhisms as there are Buddhists, you know. Everybody understands uh, under this word Buddhism, everybody has different idea. Uh, and not, not, even if we don't take into account different cultures, you know, different back cultural backgrounds like Tibetans and Japanese and Chinese. Even if we stay, I suspect, just with the, within America, <laughs> even American Buddhists have uh, very varied ideas about, I believe, what Buddhism is. So for myself, I decided after 30 years, I decided after all, I was not a Buddhist, that I was a Buddha's follower. So that's what I changed. And also, instead of Buddhism, I mostly say Buddha's teachings or Dhamma or something like that. Mm -hmm. Simply to make sure what I mean, uh, that uh, people understand what I mean. Because I don't mean <laughs> Tibetan culture, you know, <laughs> and the other cultures. <clears throat> Because there is nothing wrong with being interested in Tibetan culture or Chinese or Japanese culture and so on, even Sri Lankan culture. Uh, but people should know that culture, that Buddha didn't teach Buddha, uh, Tibetan culture, Tibetan, uh, Tibetan religion. So, yeah. And as for my accent, uh, I, <laughs> I used to have uh, um, my American friend was also my English teacher, but unfortunately, she never corrected my mistakes <laughs> because she thought they were cute, you know. <laughs> so that's a problem. <laughs> so that's uh, if I make mistake, it's entirely her fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she might uh, watch it later, so <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, I, I thought it would was a good idea to talk about uh, gradual training and also uh, some little bit about how it happens that uh, uh, gradually Dhamma Buddha's teaching is lost. So I I might start with that uh, short introduction about something like cosmological background. It's not completely made up by myself uh, because if you know. Some suttas in the Ghanikaya, long, long collection of discourses, the, quite a few of them uh, also describe the Buddha's idea about cosmology. Uh, interesting digression, uh, Buddha already 25 or 26 centuries ago spoke about periods of universe expansion and universe contraction, you know. So that's, uh, I thought uh, it, that was quite interesting because um, even though from the ideas uh, physicists have had about uh, 300 years ago, you know, gravity, when Newton came up with the uh, law of gravity, it should, should have been clear that universe could not have been st static, you know. 
but it took uh, two more hundred years before someone came up came up with this idea and even for someone like um, einstein it was not acceptable you know so he created this uh, complicated way how to maintain the idea of static universe which he later called his biggest mistake in life as a physicist so uh in physics in sci western science uh, it was only accepted something like 100 years ago uh, that the universe was actually expanding as they discovered so buddha spoke about this already 25 centuries ago <laughs> but at, at any rate um, we uh, our world view is heavily uh, affected by science you know and by what we are being taught in school so we have uh, this um, perception of the world as something outside like universe you know that is real and the mind consciousness is some, something secondary you know and usually when we um, notice something strange in the mind our tendency is to try to explain it through something in brain right like consciousness mind is a byproduct of electrical activity of the matter in in the brain <laughs> um, and this uh, kind of perception and opinion or view about the world is very very much ingrained in us i know what i'm talking about because that was my primary and our first uh, study subject which i um, pursued for quite a long time so many years uh, i even ended up studying at this at university i first my first year i studied astronomy and astrophysics you know <clears throat> later i abandoned it and then I went for the psychology thing and then I encountered through psychology I, I encountered Buddhist meditation interesting fact uh, my first meditation teacher Czech psychologist uh, came across Buddha's meditation in India in 1967 or 8 uh, where he met Anagarika Munindra and he was there at the same time as Joseph Goldstein so as I understand, the founder of this uh, meditation center is Mark, right? And he also, uh, I think, Joseph Goldstein is his teacher. So my teacher and his teacher uh, came or learned meditation, Buddha's meditation, for the first time from Anagarika Munira, from, from the same person. So that is how small this world is. <laughs> <clears throat> So, um, so we have this idea of uh, something, this material world around us that's something substantial and uh, that's re real, and the mind consciousness is something secondary and maybe not so real. And it takes a long time through meditation when when the this um, um, center of of substantiality starts shifting from matter towards the mind. And it takes even longer to feel that actually this this mind is primary. You know, that's the center of the world, center of the universe. And uh, one starts uh, have uh, get some sense of how this this matter can completely disappear. You know, if uh, if the meditator enters the state of strong samadhi. So strong concentration on some mental object uh, it means that this this world completely disappears it's not there and the mind doesn't remember that world you know and if it happens that meditator passes away dies in this state uh, it, this world around never will never appear you know so i am talking about it to to as kind of introduction to this cosmology idea <laughs> because uh, it's cosmology of minds you know different beings have their minds and through that they exist it's uh, life is basically process of knowing it can be knowing of this world around five senses in the human realm or it can be completely different kinds of knowings in the other realms 
all those realms are basically like here, like parallel worlds, you know, and if person dies here and is reborn in, let's say we will talk about better, <laughs> better options. <laughs> If he or she is born in a Deva realm, it's completely different kind of uh, experiencing. And then, of course, uh, 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 animal realm and hell realms, better not to talk about them too much and not to incline the mind in that direction. <laughs> but th all those are also here, you know. Uh, now, what the life or existence is about, it's a round of rebirth as you probably know from Buddha's teachings. Now, I would like to ask uh, how how many of you, who of you is quite certain about the reality of rebirth? So about half of you, uh, who of you think that maybe rebirth is, but you are not sure? Okay. And some of them think it's nonsense, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, yeah, there is also a view there that uh, um, maybe Buddha was teaching about the rebirth only because it was a common view uh, uh, in that at the time in India, people believed in reincarnation. So Buddha uh, also took that teaching, but it's uh, he didn't teach it because it is a really thing, you know, it, it exists. So this kind of idea, it's completely wrong, of course, and uh, without rebirth, Buddha's teachings don't make sense and are not needed, would not be needed. You know, if there was no rebirth, there would be no need for Buddha's teachings. <laughs> uh, it's all about how to develop the mind and mental faculties in such a way that a rebirth doesn't happen. You know, if it was not real, then you would not need, need this. <laughs> Nirvana, Nibbana is cessation of rebirth. So that's the goal, and it doesn't happen automatically that with the death, there is nothing afterwards, you know, it simply cannot be. Within the, the mental part of the universe, uh, there is something like preservation of energy, you know, so as long as uh, there is energy of craving and uh, craving for continued existence and for sense pleasures, uh, so long, this energy continues. So after uh, the body falls apart, the mental part continues because of this law of preservation of mental energy as well. <laughs> <clears throat> and as we know from Buddha's teachings, there is no beginning. So if we could remember the past, uh, no matter how far we would go in the past, there would still be something before. This is kind of mathematical definition of infinity, you know, uh, no matter how far back, if there is, there is always something before it. So this is infinity. And uh, throughout the cycles of uh, expansion and contraction of universe, most of the time, uh, the liberating teaching is not known. It's completely lost. The Dhamma, the truth, the reality is always there. But beings don't know this reality. They have some kind of wrong views, wrong ideas about the world. They think the world was created um, by God creator 5,000 years ago, I think, according to Bible. <laughs> Something like that. They can, uh, they can cal cal calculate. I think Jewish uh, religion knows exactly which year was the world was created. You know, it, and it's something like 5,000 years ago. And when you tell them, some bones of dinosaurs uh, are a few million years ago. And then they, I heard joke, you know, then they say that when the God created the world 5,000 years ago, he put into the earth uh, bones that were a million year, years old to test our faith. <laughs> <laughs> so ideas like that uh, are circulating around <laughs> and dhamma is most of the time throughout the existence of universe the dhamma is not known but because rising of the wisdom of the buddha is extremely unlikely event you know but it's not the likelihood of it is not zero it's just uh, slightly above zero so if we give it long enough time it will simply happen from time to time the buddha Arises. I am talking about some uh, some Buddha. Um, 
and from uh, the last historical Buddha's teachings, we know that before him there he mentions uh, six, I think, previous Buddhas. Uh, uh, he when he was trying, when he experienced uh, before enlightenment uh, the ability to remember past lives. So he went really far back. You know, he was probably trying to find the beginning, and he went as far as ninety-two eons according to scriptures. And within those 92 eons, um, he only saw six Buddhas before him. So it's like uh, one Buddha per 15 eons. <laughs> I don't know whether you know similarly how long eon is. It's inconceivably long. We cannot say even number of years, but uh, it, might, uh, it would appear that it could be something like 36 billion years. So, so pretty much uh, to my understanding it corresponds to the period between uh, like expansion of the world and contraction of the world you know so something like that we don't know exactly but it's extremely long so you can see how rare the appearance of the Sama Sambuddha is and um, for us this historical Buddha Siddhartha Gautama uh, appeared in the world about 25 centuries ago and now it happens every time the Buddha rises in the world, when he is alive and when he establishes the Dhamma and when there are enough uh, enlightened disciples of his, uh, that's the best state. You know, there is nothing better than this for the Dhamma, for the knowledge of the Dhamma. That's uh, uh, at that time people, uh, human beings know or disciples of the Buddha know the Dhamma uh, in its pure state as the Buddha is teaching it or has been teaching it and as uh, his uh, enlightened disciples learned it by heart and also know it through their own uh, experiential knowledge. One thing is to know uh, exact uh, wording and phrasing of the teachings uh, as taught by the Buddha, that's one level. But much more important level is to actually know it through one's own experience, you know, experiential knowledge. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, eventually, even uh, greatest being that can ever exist and wisest being uh, must pass away, must die. The body doesn't last forever, even of that being. So eventually, Buddha passes away and um, the Dhamma knowledge continues into the future, but as the first generation of his enlightened disciples dies, and the second and the third, it's a law of reality and uh, of Anicca that eventually the knowledge of the Dhamma starts changing. You know, Dhamma, uh, like reality, truth, remains the same, but knowledge of it changes in the minds of uh, human beings in the human realm. And as uh, these teachings are moving from one place where they were originally taught to different countries, different cultures uh, are interacting with the ideas that are present in those cultures and in those religions, the knowledge of the Dhamma starts changing. Eventually, new ideas are introduced and not all uh, human beings which are participate in uh, spreading of the teachings and transmitting them to future generations, not all of them are, are enlightened. Eventually defilements start influence the whole process of transmission of the teachings and decline of those teachings begins. Um, now, uh, you probably some of you probably know that Buddha said that uh, sadhama, true teachings or authentic teachings, would last only five hundred years. Do you know that? You know that, right? And now we have twenty more centuries. <laughs> so, do you think it's it's likely that all of what we know, all these ideas are correct? Now it's really tricky to 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 realize which teachings might not be completely correct, you know, or, or which ideas might not be completely correct. <laughs> <clears throat>
uh, because of course uh, we only have what we have right um so what i realized uh, i think from after many years of blundering in my own practice is this idea that i think was uh, lost and that's the idea of gradual training and that is why i'm talking about it you know because i had to change quite a lot in my own practice <clears throat> so i i check my Mm -hmm. yeah so the my my understanding of how this happened 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 it is uh, that i i myself started with burmese tradition as um, as probably your teacher as well mahasi mahasi tradition and i even went to burma for uh, 10 months retreat in 1995 so i started with this tradition and um, the movement mahasi meditation movement started in uh, in burma in the 50s um, mahasi sado had uh, a good idea that uh, actually meditation should be practiced by lay people as well so he started uh, uh, founding uh, meditation centers uh, all around the burma eventually I think now, now they have about 3,000 centers around the whole Burma. Uh, I practiced for 10 months intensively in Mahasi Center in Yangon, which was, I think, first place. It's a kind of headquarters of this movement or tradition. And there is nothing wrong with this idea, right? But it, it was something new. Before that, um, even many monks and monastics hadn't practiced much meditation and definitely not uh, it was not common for lay practitioners uh, for lay people the main focus of practice was dana and sila uh, supporting monastics and in burma many monastics uh, spent lots of time studying and not so it had not been common for monks to meditate at the time but Mahasi Sayado was uh, went against the stream. He himself was a strong practitioner, and also his teacher, I think it was Mingun Sayado. And then he started this movement of establishing meditation centers. Now, if we look into the suttas, uh, this is something. It was something really innovative, you know, new. Um, if we check Buddha's discourses. Uh, there is, I think, not even one case of a lay person uh, being described meditating and then becoming enlightened. All, all the enlightened lay people in at the Buddha's time became enlightened only by listening to Buddha's discourse. Only monks, uh, monastics are described as meditating for a long time before becoming enlightened. <laughs> uh, most... Um, Prominent example of this is Venerable Anuruddha. I quite like um, to contemplate his hymn because uh, if you read correct, uh, carefully the uh, sutta where he, he is main protagonist, and it, which is called uh, Eight Thoughts of Great Men, and also if you check his uh, verses um, in Theragatha, uh, collection of uh, verses of enlightened monks, um, uh, where he talks about his experience of enlightenment and how Buddha saved him. You can see that he was basically discouraged uh, uh, after 30 years. You know, he has been practicing for 30 years. Uh, also, Buddha told him to practice uh, ascetic practice of not lying down. So he didn't lay down for 30 years. He learned to sleep in a sitting posture. And after 30 years, he was still unenlightened and probably didn't have even jhanas. Uh, Buddha in this sutta where he which after 30 years he feels discouraged and he probably was thinking about disrobing so I kind of uh, like to contemplate this because if if even this great arahat had such a difficult time why not me <laughs> um, <clears throat> so so 
in the case of lay practitioners at the Buddha's time, it was always a case that uh, those people uh, had been strong practitioners beforehand. You know, they cultivated all the abilities and mental qualities in the past, sometime in the past. And uh, they were born at the Buddha's time as what I call meditation prodigies. That is how prodigies in any field happen. It's not a gift of God, you know, that one person out of a million is born as prodigy. But it's because they had been practicing that thing, that field in the past and are born already with the, the abilities ready. <laughs> and then it's for them, it happens uh, quickly. Uh, whether they are born as meditation prodigies, then they may become enlightened quickly if they hear the right teaching for them. Or if it is like prodigy in uh, any other field, like uh, piano playing, and they can become concert players at the age of five. <laughs> I think in the, in the United States, there is this uh, girl called Emily Bear. Do you know her? Piano prodigy. So she was composing uh, at the age of five. Uh, I think she was the youngest performer in Carnegie Hall at the age of eight. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this happens in any can happen in any field like mathematics also and uh, it's because simply th those people already are born with those abilities from past lives nothing magic about it you know so um at the buddha's time uh, the intense meditation was really meant for monastics so whoever wished to pursue this kind of path and uh, practice for liberation the first step was to become monastic so ajan uh, uh, Mahasi Sayadaw uh, innovatively <laughs> began this uh, movement of lay meditation. There is nothing wrong with it, but the problem is that through maybe not paying attention uh, to what the Buddha was teaching um, and not paying attention that there is actually something like gradual training and not uh, realizing that uh, intense meditation is only fifth step, you know, before one, beca beca before one comes to meditation center and embarks on intense meditation, one needs to be well established in these five steps. Do you know what they are? <laughs> okay, so I will, I think, read. <laughs> some passages from Buddha's teaching on gradual training. It's kind of, it was revealing, you know, when I realized that actually in my case, uh, my, um, the way I came to meditation was exactly opposite of gradual training. Exactly the opposite, antithesis, you know. <laughs> because uh, I learned about this uh, three-day course of in meditation I, I didn't know anything about Buddha's teaching. I knew only, only the word Buddha and Buddhism. And I just thought, hmm, Buddhist meditation, that sounds interesting. And I thought it had something to do with, with levitation, you know? Mm -hmm. So I thought mm, three days, I didn't have much time. I was kind of busy with the studying psychology and so on. But uh, uh, so I had to keep convincing myself to actually go, <laughs> but I did. And uh, together with my classmate in psychology and another friend of ours who was studying philosophy so we went by train it was uh, like three hours for our for our ride to northern moravia close to polish border <laughs> and uh, before we came to the uh, little like center or uh, uh, hostel uh, mount in mountains uh, we knew that we would not be able to drink beer, so we went first to a nearby pub in, in near railway station, and we drank about, I think, maybe one or two beers. Czechs are, by the way, big beer drink, drinkers, you know, number one in, in the world. <laughs> we drink about 60% more, more beer per year than the second nation, which are Germans, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So we drank this beer and uh, we, we came to this center in a little like mood, you know. <laughs> and then evening, uh, Thursday evening, 7th of May, 1992, we were asked to sit down, cross the gate, close eyes and uh, not move for 45 minutes without even hearing anything about Buddha's teachings. So that was 
immediately jumping into intense meditation. <laughs> and unfortunately, I, I pretty much continued with this uh, for quite long before uh, I only I, uh, recently I realized that actually, uh, for instance, something like um, mindfulness in daily activities should come before formal meditation and should be uh, established well before that. You know, so that's now I'm going to to read for you um, the essence of um, Buddha's teaching on gradual training. This uh, teaching appears in many suttas. It's sometimes it's more detailed, sometimes less detailed. Uh, this uh, this is coming from Samanya Pala Sutta, uh, the second sutta in Dighanikaya, uh, which is most detailed. I will not read all the details, but uh, just essence of it. So. Uh, this gradual training always starts something like this. This teaching was given to King Ajata Satu, so it was given to lay person, right? but it's uh, mostly meant for monastics. <clears throat> Hearing great king that Hagata rises in the world, a worthy one, perfectly enlightened, endowed with clear knowledge and conduct, accomplished an over of the world, unsurpassed. <laughs> English, <laughs> unsurpassed, past, <clears throat> uh, trainer of man to be tamed, teacher of gods and men, enlightened, exalted. So this is uh, something uh, referring to this cosmology I mentioned before. This is the first uh, condition without which gradual training doesn't happen. First, uh, Buddha must arise in the world. So he is exceptional, you know, and every, everybody else attains enlightenment as disciple of the Buddha. In um, the, the suttas, uh, the term Arya Savako is mentioned about 25,000 times, I think. And it was translated I, very much like Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. This is, uh, this is one. But one of, of the mistakes he made that he, when he translated Arya Savako as noble disciple. It actually means noble one's disciple. You know, this Arya, Sanabako means disciple. And one cannot be disciple, you know, without teacher, right? If someone is disciple, then someone is disciple of someone, right? So this Arya doesn't mean adjective to the Sanabako disciple, but uh, means noble one's disciple, so disciple of a noble one. That's that's very important. And interestingly, I, I heard um, Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, talk uh, for, about uh, about this, and he actually defines it correctly. But I think because uh, he liked uh, this uh, noble uh, noble disciple, is more streamlined phrase. So he kept keeps it, even though he knows it's not completely correct. You know, but it's uh, quite important to be aware of the fact that uh, we need to have a teacher. Without a teacher, we 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 are only left with the option to become buddhas ourselves and that may take a long time <laughs> several eons <laughs> so it's better i think to to find a teacher um, nowadays of course we can replace to some extent uh, teach living teacher with texts but it's not a full uh, fully full replacement you know it's a very weak actually it's uh, better than nothing but it's not uh, completely um, as they had it at the Buddha's time, when they, when they had a living Buddha at their disposal. Hmm. Having realized by his own direct knowledge, this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its rulers and people, he makes it known to others. He teaches the dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, possessing meaning and phrasing. He reveals the holy life that is fully complete and purified. You know, this holy life, Brahmacharya, that's, uh, that means primarily like celibacy. <laughs> so it means really monastics. A householder or a householder's son. Now there is a gender bias in, in Sudas. You, know, you cannot it cannot be denied. It's simply there. What can we do? <laughs> uh, historical time. So it uh, it it is of course um, also applies to women. But the yeah, yeah. 
another team, <laughs> a householder or a householder's son or one born into some other family, hears the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he gains faith in the Tathagata. Tathagata means Buddha. In doubt with such faith, he reflects. The household life is crowded, a path of dust. Going forth is like the open air. It's not easy for one dwelling at home to lead the perfectly complete, perfectly purified holy life, bright as a polished conch. Let me then shave off my hair and beard, put on saffron robes and go forth from home to homelessness. After some time, he abandons his accumulation of wealth, be it large or small. He abandons his circle of relatives, be it large or small. He shaves off his hair and beard, puts on saffron robes and goes forth from home to homelessness. So this is always in, in, in all formulations of gradual training, beginning of is going forth, so becoming monastic. You know. So this gradual training was not originally um, designed for people who stay in lay life. Now, I think that people can uh, approximate this step by uh, practicing dana a lot. Because uh, as you can see from this formulation, what a person who becomes monastic does is to give away everything. Right? So it's an ultimate giving. It's a fulfillment of dana. You know, the, one of the pillars of Dhamma practice, dana is the bhavana, three pillars, giving, virtue, and cultivation. So giving is fulfilled by person when he or she goes forth and becomes monastic and gives away all the possessions. I had to give away my apartment in Prague, my um, lucrative uh, job, which I enjoyed a lot, and I had to part with my girlfriend also. So it's not a small thing, you know, going forth is not a small thing. So that is why it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Sometimes I, I wonder, you know, I uh, in Sri Lanka, when I was living in this um, uh, solitary kuti in the jungle, I had to go to the village for Pindapat for arms round every day. And then when I was going back, I was crossing the paddy fields, you know, on this um, little um, damp, Dams in between. And I, I saw uh, village men plowing, you know, in the scorching sun um, behind water buffaloes, two, bu two water buffaloes and one blade to plow the <laughs> fields. And they were all mm, dirty from mud, you know, and wet and <laughs> sun above. And they saw me walk passing them, you know. Uh, nicely dressed, comfortable with food, which I didn't have to work for. And they could do the same thing, you know, they could go forth. And if anyone in that village could also become a monk or nun. For for ladies, it's a little more difficult, but they can. There are nunneries there. Now they have this movement uh, that they even can ordain fully. So they can do that, but almost nobody does. Why is it? <laughs> Yeah. So after some time, he abandons his accumulation of, of wealth and go forth to homelessness. Then he has thus gone forth. He lives restrained by the restraint of the Pati Mokha, possessed of proper behavior and resort. Having taken up the rules of training, he trains himself in them, seeing danger in the slightest faults. So this is the second step, you know, purification of virtue. Uh, monastics spent quite, quite some time learning how to live in, in accordance with the rules. Uh, we have ba monks have basic 227 rules, which are like central and most important. Besides them, we have about several thousand smaller rules, most of which we even don't know. And that's not a problem, but uh, we keep learning basically the whole, the, the rest of the life. Uh, when it comes to it, we, we hear 
a rule about a rule and then we adopt it. <laughs> uh, Bikunis uh, nuns had many more rules already at the Buddha's time. So again, gender bias. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So purification of virtue. Uh, here at the beginning, uh, he summarizes uh, the all the steps before intense meditation, before formal meditation. So it's purification of virtue. Then he comes to be endowed with the wholesome bodily verbal action. His livelihood is purified and he is possessed of moral discipline. Then the other steps are he guards the doors of his sense faculties, is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension, comprehension and is content. These are three more steps before meditation. And now, now Buddha describes in more detail these uh, three steps. And how great king, king does the bhikkhu guard the doors of his sense faculties? Herein, great king, having seen a form with the eye, the bhikkhu does not grasp at the sign or the details. Since if he were to dwell without restraint over, over the faculty of the eye, evil unwholesome unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the eye, and achieves restraint over, over the faculty of the eye. And the same goes on for all the rest of the senses. So hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. And also the mind. Having cognized a mind object with mind, which, in, which means thoughts, you know. the big who does not grasp at the sign or the details. Since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the mind, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the mind, and achieves restraint over the, over the faculty of the mind. In doubt with this noble restraint of the sense faculties, he experiences within himself an unblemished happiness. In this way, great king, Bhikkhu guards the doors of the sense faculties. And how great king is the noble, is the Bhikkhu in doubt with mindfulness and clear comprehension? Herein, herein Bhikkhu, uh, great king, uh, in going forward and returning, the bhikkhu acts with clear comprehension. <clears throat> In looking ahead and looking aside, he acts with clear comprehension. In bending and stretching the limbs, he acts with clear comprehension. In wearing his robes and cloak and using his arms bowl, he acts with clear comprehension. In eating, drinking, chewing, tasting, he acts with clear comprehension. In defecating and urinating, he acts with clear comprehension. In going, standing, sitting, lying down, waking up, speaking, and remaining silent, he acts with clear comprehension. In this way, great king, the bhikkhu is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension. So this is the step which, which we would normally call like mindfulness in daily activities. I pray. <clears throat> I prefer, by the way, as uh, Nandana Mahatya mentioned, uh, I realized also not so long ago that actually, um, for me, the better description of sati, you know, this original word, uh, which is most commonly translated as mindfulness, actually, the better word for me is presence. It uh, is more direct description of that quality. If you see it's directly without, without mediation of words. So this comes before, before meditation. This this kind of uh, presence while doing things is foundation for uh, for successful um, intense meditation later, according to Buddha. And how great king is the bhikkhu content? Hearing great king a bit. A bhikkhu is content with ropes to protect his body and alms food to sustain his belly. Wherever, wherever he goes, he sets out taking only his requisites along with him. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings, 
as its only burden. In the same way, a bhikkhu is content with robes to protect his body and arms food to sustain his belly. Wherever he, get, he goes, he sets out taking only his requisites along with him. In this way, great king, the bhikkhu is content. So, yeah, so, so, so simply developing contentment with, with, with what one has already, you know, not uh, if a smartphone is still working, there is no need to, <laughs> to buy a better model, model. <laughs> something like that. <clears throat> and then uh, Buddha proceeds towards, uh, uh, slowly towards uh, formal meditation. He says, in doubt with this noble aggregate of moral discipline, so first purification of virtue, this noble restraint over the sense faculties, this noble mindfulness and clear comprehension or mindfulness in daily activities, and this noble contentment, he resorts to a secluded dwelling, a forest, the foot of a tree, a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave, a cremation ground, a jungle grove, the open air, a heap of straw. After return, ret returning from his arms round, following his meals, he sits down, crosses his legs, holds his body erect, and sets up mindfulness before him. So this is where, where uh, formal meditation starts, you know. And the resorting uh, to cave and so on, one could include nowadays also meditation center, right? <laughs> <clears throat> And now it continues a description how um, bhikkhu or monastic, after uh, coming back from alms round, practices walking back and forth and sitting, purifying his mind or her mind of obstructive states, which is five hindrances. So um, the main focus when one finally comes uh, to formal meditation after having established the previous steps is um, overcoming or purifying one's mind from hindrances. So from um, sensual desire, ill will, sleepiness and tiredness, restlessness and um, remorse and doubt. And then it continues, the description of gradual training continues once the faculties are, uh, once these hindrances are Abandoned, when he sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within himself, gladness arises. When he is gladdened, rapture arises. When his mind is filled with rapture, his body becomes tranquil. Tranquil in the body, he, he experiences happiness. Being happy, his mind becomes concentrated. And then he, Buddha goes on with the description of jhanas, full full uh, like sama, sama samadhi and then interestingly even in this sutta for delivered to a king he speaks about lots of psychic powers you know and eventually also overcoming all the defilements in the mind and becoming enlightened so <clears throat> you see this is a very different uh, description of the practice than the one that is commonly taught in Mahasi centers or in Goenka uh, or in even in the monastery where I was ordained later, you know, Pauk, it's completely something completely, completely different <laughs> to my to my uh, understanding. <laughs> so, how did it happen? So, I think idea of uh, establishing meditation centers for the lay people to retreat uh, for uh, limited time to to practice intensively is not wrong. But the problem is that this idea eventually led to losing the sight of gradual training, you know. <laughs> so it's correct and recommendable definitely for you to also practice meditation, but you should be aware of uh, the, the, uh, the other steps which are also important. I think uh, med many practitioners in the West, especially I think underestimate completely the practice of dana, for instance, you know, for, for, for me now, coming from countries like Sri Lanka and Bur Burma, and also Thailand, when I see this incredibly developed generosity in that in those cultures, and then I come back to Czech Republic, <laughs> and I see how basically 
completely almost completely absent dan practice of dana is you know it's an unbelievable difference <laughs> and but without that um, the training is not complete the buddha says only person who practices completely achieves or attains completely the person who practices partially attains partially <laughs> Then, uh, of course, bread you for lay practitioners, five precepts should be absolute minimum. I think and recommendable, maybe eight precepts uh, on moon days, once a week. And then the other practices, um, I would think uh, what should be recommended to lay practitioners to emphasize uh, this presence in daily activities, mindfulness in daily activity, activities. It should be viewed as more important than uh, formal meditation formal meditation yes from time to time once a day or so but the rest of the day should be really we, sh uh, we should really focus on <laughs> being present as much as possible whatever we are doing mm. now i have already spoken almost one hour i'm surprised by myself i'm normally finish after half an hour <laughs> and have nothing else to say <laughs> uh, Maybe I might share uh, uh, as a conclusion uh, two similes which I developed for myself to to um, to understand correctly uh, how to approach meditation or basically also the the ho the whole dharma practice development of the path. Uh, I see development of the dharma path as uh, kind of uh, building Shvedagon pagoda. Do you know Do you know Shvedagon pagoda? In Burma, it's it is the most important monument in uh, in that culture in Burma. Burma, it's something like um, uh, Saint Peter's Cathedral for Catholics, you know. So it's like a huge huge pagoda of of this kind of shape. It's uh, it starts with a large foundation and it gradually gets uh, more narrow and narrow, and only this uh, path which goes really high, about almost hundred meters high, uh, is quite narrow. So I sort of think that uh, meditation is like that. You you have to build first uh, because it's very high building. You know the the top, which means enlightenment, is uh, very high. So uh, for that such a high building to really stand and not to fall, it needs to have a solid large foundation. And this large foundation is the first step, like a purification of sila. Let's say that. <laughs> clearing the ground would be uh, becoming monastic or at least some appro approximation of it but uh, the first layer is like purification i would say dana actually dana giving and every act of giving is like putting a brick into this layer right so every, you need to put quite a lot of bricks there <laughs> And also every act of uh, purification of virtues, which means mostly also taking five precepts, but mostly when you have uh, urge to break one of the five precepts, saying no to it is like break, another break in this foundation. You know? And uh, I would say in this first layer, most of those breaks should be dana and sila, and occasionally also formal meditation. You know? uh, and also... Uh, any time you remember that you should be present at any time of the day, you know, you just, uh, uh, mind, mind naturally keeps forgetting. But if you remember, if at that moment you decide, okay, now I remembered, I should be present with what I am doing. So I will try. And if you decide to try, you know, then that's another break. <laughs> if you, on the other hand, if you remember and say, ah, I have not been mindful for two hours. I am hopeless. Forget about it. You know, I just wait until evening until I have time to meditate. So then you lost it. Then you uh, lost the opportunity opportunity to put more one more break there. You know, <laughs> and as it goes up, uh, the percent uh, proportion of uh, formal meditation breaks can become more and more. And when you come to this narrow path, it can be just meditation. You after you have established strong enough foundation of these steps before then in this narrow path narrow part of the pagoda is made of mostly just uh, formal meditation sittings maybe <laughs> uh, 
what we do uh, and what I was doing, I was trying to build this pagoda on a very narrow foundation, you know. So then it goes at the beginning because it's narrow, it goes quickly up, but it reaches a certain point and then you cannot get higher. Then you have to go back and you have to enlarge the foundation and then you go, can go up and you reach uh, maybe a little higher than before, but again, you get stuck. So. You, it can be built in this way also, you know, like not just layers like this, but small pagodas within the bigger pagoda. <laughs> so that's one of the similes which I remind myself quite often before sitting, you know, before I start sitting, I remind myself that it is a gradual training and and it is like that. The other the other simile is growing plants um, in a meditation. I actually uh, prefer instead of meditation, I prefer to use the word cultivation for as a translation of bhavana, you know, this third pillar, bhavana, normally translated as meditation, but I think cultivation includes also cultivating presence in daily activities. So it's like in, even in, in a formal settings, the cultivation is, uh, is there. And it's mostly about cultivating five faculties. And I visualize at the beginning of each sitting or when I remember, I visualize these five faculties as five plants, maybe three seedlings. I just need to make uh, sure that they have right conditions for growing, but they grow by itself on their own. I cannot make them grow uh, directly, like putting plants out of the ground to make them grow faster. Right. So I just need to make sure that they have the right conditions. And what is the right condition for growth of presence? plant some kind of correct effort and uh, what i suggest uh, as uh, mandana mahatya mentioned the main focus of right effort is should go into rem just keeping in mind to be present remembering keeping in mind to be present that's the effort and if you manage to keep it in mind to be present then you are present and you just keep it and the presence itself grows by itself uh, with the time so it does need a time you cannot uh, it is not the case that when you try harder you attain faster right? you just need to find the right level of effort and the right quality right kind of effort and once you have it you just need to keep keep it but uh, the rest happens uh, without your influence you know it uh, uh, how quickly any person or meditator becomes uh, uh, advanced meditator depends solely on how much he or she practiced in the past including past lives you cannot change that right it's just there if you didn't practice enough in the past then in this life, you will need uh, to keep it going for maybe a long time, you know, for years or maybe for lifetimes, you know. <laughs> All those who, be who became enlightened quickly at the Buddha's time, lay people or, or, or monastics just by hearing Buddha's teaching, did so or managed to do so because they had practiced uh, for probably for lifetimes beforehand. So if we don't have this store of merit behind us from the past then we, we have to accumulate it in this life <laughs> so that's uh, i hope um, uh, this is in my understanding the right approach to meditation cultivation and to pursuing this um, buddha's path of uh, dhamma towards hopefully final liberation of the heart so now is the time for questions. I suspect there will be some noises there because I kept moving late. <laughs> Thank you, Bante. So we'll use this microphone. And so whoever would like to ask a question, we'll just pass the mic around. And, uh, and also, why don't we go back and forth? So we'll start with Pietro here in the room. And then if there's someone on Zoom, you can just unmute yourself and we'll hear you here in the room. We'll start with Pietro. Thank you. Thank you, Bante. 
my name is Pietro. I'll throw another accent in the room, Italian accent. <laughs> so I was wondering, I understand the, the emphasis on daily meditation, daily cultivation, but I was wondering what do you think about this concept of momentum? So what I find for me is that if I practice more formally, there is that uh, momentum. Get, so it feels a little easier maybe or more spontaneous or just happens more often to remember, to remember, mm -hmm. remem remember to be present, which I feel like if I didn't practice, if I practice less, let's say formally, I feel like the momentum is more lost. Uh, so I was wondering if there is, could be like sort of like a synergy there between uh, formal and daily life mm -hmm. cultivation. Yeah. Uh, you know, the tricky part is that we don't know how much he, we had practiced in the past. You know, so for I believe that, uh, for instance, in Burma, this kind of approach like meditation centers going straight into intense meditation may work for some some of them because they were born in Burma for some reason. Mm -hmm. And this may apply to Westerners as well. You know, among Westerners also, there still might be someone who had, who has practiced or had practiced uh, enough uh, in the past. So for them, it might be oh, all right, correct to go straight into intense meditation. In my case, I kind of wonder because, um, for instance, when I did this 10 months retreat, it was really like, um, as you probably know, in Mahasi, it was something like 12 hours of formal meditation uh, or maybe more for 10 months, you know. So I would say under average person would go crazy. <laughs> and I didn't, you know, but I don't think I, I have been born like um, meditation prodigy, but uh, something in my mind protected me and uh, later when i ordained permanently in 2000 it was even more you know i practiced uh, in this kind of intensity for something like four years uh, first year eight hours of sitting meditation not much walking because it was not uh, emphasized there and then i had to decrease because my body could not uh, continue in this way so then it was just maybe six hours of formal meditation and some walking meditation and of course efforts to be present uh, throughout the whole day for four years continuously almost <clears throat> and again i didn't go crazy <laughs> so i think i i was doing something correctly but not all of it so some of it was uh, a wrong kind of effort so in in back to your question what what is uh problem with going to formal meditation too quickly is that your mind doesn't know in what way to make the right kind of effort you know it should not be willpower but if you had you have practiced enough in past lives also maybe your mind knows instinct instinctively how to do it correctly but the danger is uh, for many people that if they go to formal meditation too early, uh, they don't know about it, but they make a wrong kind of effort, which I think may appear on the physical level as some kind of tightening here, you know. And uh, if a meditator develops, for instance, uh, pressure in a head, you know, so that's probably a sign of uh, uh, not completely correct way of effort in, in a formal meditation. So yeah, on a practical level, it may be difficult to for practitioners to at the beginning forget about formal meditation and to practice just present moment in daily activities. So some kind of balance need to be find, found, you know, and um, it's also difficult, even if you know that uh, presence in daily activities is important, still it can be difficult to convince your mind to do it. <laughs> I Even after I uh, adopted this idea, sometimes I catch myself uh, to be terribly in a hurry walking back to my kuti so that I'm on, uh, on a meditation cushion as quick, as soon as possible. You know, instead of simply using this very moment to to practice. So when I realize this, I usually stop. You know, 
I just stop and stay at this place and meditate there. And then I go as slowly as possible to the Kuti. And uh, in this way, I'm trying to convince my mind <laughs> that this is also important, you know. <clears throat> so yeah, so, so some kind of combination of uh, formal practice and uh, the other practices is uh, important. Mm -hmm. Balance, balance. Is there anyone on Zoom who would like to ask a question? If so, you can just unmute yourself. Okay, that's fine. Anyone else here in the room? Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm curious about, you mentioned these these five steps, these prerequisite steps, and it seems, I don't know personally from reading, but based on what you said, it shows up many times. Um, and if one of those steps is taking the monastic life, what is the justification for moving into formal practice without that step, if it mm -hmm. seems to be laid out so clearly? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Mahasi Sado <laughs> started that. that. Uh, we may say that uh, this this historical time is different than the Buddha's time. You know, at the Buddha's time, it is true that uh, if uh, one remained in lay life, uh, he or she would not have time, you know, because uh, it was completely different economically, and uh, it was not easy to to have free time. <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, it's much easier. Uh, for me, the other justification is, you know, the becoming monastic is like becoming meditation professional. So it means you have all the time available for meditation. While if you are keep practicing as lay person and you have to make your living by going to work and job and so on, it takes time away from you, right? So, um, so it's not possible. Is it, is it possible to become a Grand Slam winner? If you play tennis as an amateur, it's not possible. You have to become professional. Right? So similarly with um, enlightenment, it would seem like that. But uh, I think in the sphere of meditation, it's more hopeful because you cannot play tennis while doing other things, but you can cultivate presence while doing other things. You know? So it depends on, on your discipline and motivation. If you... <clears throat> And justification is that uh, you don't, this ultimate goal of enlightenment doesn't have to be the only goal. You actually collect many sweet fruits along the way, you know, so as lay person, you may not aspire to become uh, enlightened in this life, but you can still aspire to develop your mind, to become more skillful in dealing with the difficult situation. And that's what ha what's happening through formal meditation as well, you know, formal meditation, or cultivation is uh, about uh, growing those five faculties mindfulness or presence uh, mental energy confidence um, focus or stillness of attention and discernment and all these faculties just by growing them you become more competent in dealing with life difficulties you become more skillful in dealing with the difficult emotional states in fact if you grow these faculties enough uh, you cease to be able to become depressed for instance you know because uh, with the presence one can catch quickly the chain of thought which uh, which causes the mind to sink into depression or something like that sadness so uh, almost automatically the mind stops thinking those thoughts and almost immediately the emotional level is raised to <laughs> something much better so yeah so this kind of goal for lay practitioners is worthwhile and that is why it is recommendable to practice you know meditation also as lay person but i i say whoever is really interested and motivated in actually realizing the uh, liberation, you know, at least at the level of stream entry, then he or she should consider 
for day and day. It would be most natural step, not easy step, of course. That is why it doesn't happen so often. I have my friend in Prague, you know, he's hopeless. He doesn't have family, he doesn't have job, he doesn't have, he has possessions, you know, but and he was, he has been thinking about becoming monk for 20 years and he still cannot do it, you know. And there is nothing really to keep him there, just habits maybe and fear or something. So, yeah, it's not easy, but uh, yeah, enlightenment is worthwhile. formulate the, the thought but uh, thank you also for for coming and giving a, a wonderful talk um so when talking about maintaining presence uh, sitting sitting alone doing things alone uh, focusing on the body uh even watching my mind pop up from time to time and, and getting and catching myself before the thinking of a past or the future can happen um is is a little more easy how do you or do you have any advice on maintaining presence of where your mind is taking you when you have to refer to yourself and and previous ideas of who you are to say hold a conversation with someone does that make sense um mm -hmm. our our world almost demands it when talking about our history on our resume um and uh, when I'm alone and watching my own thoughts, I can kind of view them separately from me or from awareness or from the presence. But then I go to hang out with someone or I'm with a coworker and hours goes by um, and I'm not lost necessarily in the past or the future, but that background mind has been perpetuating that, that idea of self without the thought even existing. So how do you catch presence when you're lost in the history of who you are if that makes yeah. sense yeah i i think i understand uh, different sets of circumstances are more conducive or less conducive to maintaining presence in some situation it's easier in some more difficult we start with the easier ones so that what you mentioned when you are alone and when you are doing something which doesn't require mu much thinking then you you do that <clears throat> and you are not to have too much ambition you know that's also a tricky part you know to find or find out uh, when you put when you have too much ambition or too much perfectionism also i i found the one of the biggest obstacles for me is perfectionism. You know, you have the idea how it should go, uh, how you should maintain presence throughout the whole day. And then uh, you you find that your mind for, keeps forgetting often. And then you tend to be disheartened. You know, perfectionist either does it perfectly from the beginning or doesn't do it at all. You know, that's, a, that's <laughs> the pattern in me. <laughs> So, yeah, so one needs to keep reflecting about the fact that only Arahat is perfect. You know, only Arahat can maintain presence continuously without lapses. Or, already Anagami may, has some uh, lapses of presence, so his mind from time to time forgets. And then all the low, lower stages, the lapses of mindfulness are more frequent and longer. So when you when you realize that uh, you, you just uh, had had been or has been in uh, have been <laughs> in the labs and now you remember it and you reflect back and you you see that it was three hours without presence you know so then you can re reflect aha uh -huh, that is where I am you know this is uh, where the how far the the cultivation of presence reached you know, this is what happens. So from this moment, 
you just need, need to keep going. You cannot make sure that you don't forget, you know? And also you are not too, too concerned about not being present in the situations where it is most difficult to maintain presence, like talking myself, you know, uh, while talking and while listening to someone talking and understanding these two uh, circumstances are the most difficult for maintaining presence because the mind is engaged while talking or while listening to someone understanding this is very complicated mental activity you know so for instance for listeners uh, this this kind of speech is just sound right so the mind needs to um, make sense of the sound makes to uh, needs to identify sex sections of it as words you know and then it needs to uh, when every word happens <laughs> the mind needs to recall this sound and may uh, connect it with some past memory right you, uh, so you recall the meaning of the word from the personal dictionary <laughs> in the mind and then you connect it, or the mind connects it with past past experience to understand what it means actually and then it the mind needs to re keep remembering the words until the whole sentence is finished and to, to make sense of it you know and then to some extent it also has to remember past sentences so that there is some kind of co coherence to it you know so it's extremely complicated uh, mental activity and maintaining presence while doing this is really difficult not easy for me it, it i can only maintain presence while talking only since uh, like two years ago maybe now i'm a little bit more skillful in it of course there are lapses but with the experience and with the reflection, I know that these lapses are inevitable, you know. So only when I remember while talking, I can maintain uh, presence. And it's kind of interesting also to watch the, how the ideas arise in the mind, you know, Vitaka, initial thought. The I know just one sentence beforehand what I'm going to say, you know, this idea is there already, uh, the whole of it on preferable level it's kind of interesting how is it possible that you have idea without formulating it you know in two words it happens only afterwards so this thought is there and then the mind needs to maintain that thought until the whole sentence come out comes out you know so it's kind of <laughs> very interesting to watch vitaka vichara vitaka rising of the thought and vichara keeping that thought until it goes out which is called um, speech formation vitaka vichara initial thought and sustained thought it's Bhubhika Bodhi's translation <laughs> my translation is taking up and holding on to <laughs> so uh, yeah so you just don't uh, put too much ambition on yourself and uh, just start with the more simple situations for maintaining presence and then once these are in place then you can try to do to Keep keep con conversing with some someone while maintaining presence. Not easy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. The time. Maybe one more question or two more questions. <clears throat> my in my experience, uh, you information overload. You know, too much of it. <laughs> already too much so don't worry about forgetting almost everything if you just uh, take uh, just two three uh, thoughts new useful thoughts for yourself that's enough you know you can forget all the rest and uh, it comes back later when you need it that's my experience also sometimes uh, uh, teachings come back to me after like 25 years i, I kind of <clears throat> I'm amazed how that is possible. You know, just a little simple teachings from one Burmese monk in 1997. And it came back to me recently. <laughs> so, yeah. So any last question? Thank you, Mante, um, for your generosity speaking with us tonight. Um, my question um, 
is around Dana, and I appreciate um, how you provided this um, very provocative metaphor of the foundation of the pagoda. And, um, and just I find with Dana that um, there are moments, probably when there's presence and some concentration where Dana really can feel like a like a a sense of freely giving, you know, without um, without an attachment to how the act of Dana will be, how how this self will be perceived for for giving. And um, but then there are times where I find uh, I notice in an act of generosity, um, the self thing that comes in, like, oh, like people will see me as good for giving. And um, it's sometimes it's very subtle, you know? And mm -hmm. so I was just wondering if you could speak to um, sometimes that, sometimes I wonder, like, it, it would it be better to, to give completely anonymously to avoid the, the self thing that comes up mm -hmm, through mm -hmm. Donna? Um, or just a place for practice. Um, I don't know if I'm articulating my question the way that you're understanding, but just if I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about. Mm -hmm. This is uh, if if even if the selfing of this kind happens, it's very subtle. You know, it's not uh, serious. Uh, um, bad karma, which you sh I would say you should be concerned about. You know, basically any giving, even if there is this kind of trace of uh, self in it, is still recommendable. You know, it, there is. I think uh, again, uh, perfectionism is is in at play here. You see. <laughs> But of course, you can also, if you notice uh, this kind of, um, you are about to give something and you start thinking how you will appear uh, to those people who's, who know about it. You can, you can also uh, use it as a kind of object for meditation, for, for training the presence, sati, you know, mindfulness of defilements. Uh, in Satipatthana Sutta, uh, that's one of the objects, you know, for training. So you don't practice Satipatthana just on uh, wholesome states, you know, uh, unwholesome states. If you are able to notice it, you know, which is pretty good, uh, this is kind of a subtle thing. And if you are aware of it, that's quite, quite good. You, you may be happy about it. <laughs> so you just, um, yeah, notice, okay, selfing. Uh, yeah, one, one of the uh, correct approaches to uh, defilements is just to be mindful, to be aware of them, you know. Uh, that's something which was not explained to me either very well, that uh, I, I only after many years I realized that I'm dealing with defilements in such a way that I basically put another defilement of, on the top of it, you know by developing kind of aversion towards that defilement, you know. So one of the important things is when you notice any kind of defilement, whether it is selfing, during giving or anything else, just uh, to be aware of it. Huh? Okay, selfing, selfing. You stay with it and you, you watch it. And if judging, judging yourself because of it comes about, again, you just, ah, judging, judging. You know, or refusal of myself. Okay, refusal. You know, <laughs> the the defilements can be very quick. So you notice defile one defilement at one moment, and at the same time, it, it extremely quickly, aversion towards towards it arises. It, that's another defilement on the top of it. But at this, at some point, I I believe the mind finally uh, manages to catch it quickly enough without becoming without developing any other defilement as a re reaction to it. So then it might happen if, if it's after five or five or six steps, 
that uh, you start laughing at it, you know, and then that's that's kind of uh, um, best way that that can happen. <laughs> yeah. So just notice selfing. Okay, I'm giving right now, and I I feel proud of it, and I hope others will notice it and will admire me for it. So okay, it's helping. This is the mind uh, as it is. Okay, so may you succeed in uh, developing the path of drama all the way to full enlightenment, whether in this life or sometimes in the future. Thank you so much, Bhante. Just come up here to make an announcement and pay my respects as well. So thank you again, Bhante, and thank you, Nandana, for the connection, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Really lovely to spend the evening in Dharma um, discussion with a, um, yeah, such a well-practiced and knowledgeable teacher. So I feel really grateful and just want to share um, with everyone, if you're new to Common Ground or even if you're not, it's always, you know, as we've been hearing about the practice of dana, it's not just theory. Here at Common Ground, we uh, do our best to put it into practice. And um, so the way it works, just logistically, you know, everything is offered freely. Obviously, Bhante is, like he was saying, his whole life is an example of, of living in this way. Um, so if you would like to make a donation, the way we, we do it at Common Ground is two-thirds of that donation will go to uh, support Bhante. And, you know, he's a traveler, I've heard. So I'm sure uh, in some way that that could be helpful. And uh, and then one third just supports our operations here, keeping the lights on and and so forth. Um, if you have any questions about that, um, you can talk to me afterwards. Rachel's our program host as well. You could talk to her. Okay, thanks again, Bante. Hmm.